There are many challenges in conducting evaluation, and finding creative ways to deal with them is part of the enjoyment of the work. Today we want to focus on three thorny issues that are encountered frequently and seem particularly relevant for the kind of work IRL teams might be taking on now and in the future. These three thorny issues are negative evaluation findings, interpreting results, and evaluation anxiety and distrust. As with research, it's not always easy to understand what your evaluation results mean. With evaluation, however, you have the added concern that in the best of all possible worlds, people will be using your results to make decisions in the near future. You want to make sure they're interpreted correctly. In fact, justifying conclusions, documenting the reasoning behind interpretation of findings, and guarding against distortions of findings are part of the Joint Committee's evaluation standards. When you have positive evaluation results, the most likely problem in interpretation will be over-attribution of those results to the program or intervention you are evaluating. For example, we recently saw emergency department utilization rates decline for a group of patients receiving an intervention, and we were very excited. The next year, however, we saw the rates go up again. Both events may have been part of normal fluctuation. It is crucial, therefore, to do two things. Explicitly state any limitations on the strength of the conclusions resulting from the methodology you used, and within the context of available resources and all the trade-offs we've discussed among evaluation criteria, design your evaluation to make your ability to draw conclusions as strong as possible. This does not always mean using a randomized control trial or another very strong research design to enhance internal validity, although sometimes it might. It might also mean looking at the same question in more than one way to see if you consistently find the same answer. For example, using qualitative and quantitative data together is a great way to do this. When you have negative evaluation results, there are two questions I think it is particularly important to ask yourself. The first is whether this indicates a failure of program theory or failure of program implementation. In other words, was the program as designed not adequate or appropriate for achieving the desired outcomes, or was it actually never carried out as designed? To use the example of the education-based diabetes management intervention we discussed in another module, if participants' diabetes management did not improve, is that because the education designed by the program heads was not what the participants needed? Or is it because the health educators, for one reason or the other, didn't actually deliver the curriculum that had been designed? Another question you'll always want to ask yourself is whether you were measuring the right thing in the right way. For example, the diabetes education program may, may not have brought about the changes you hoped for in blood sugar at the time of your evaluation, but it may actually have brought about behavior changes that will lead to changes in blood sugar over the long term. I should note here that when you have positive findings, you may also have measured the wrong thing. Something changed, but maybe that was something that wasn't important. So how do we deal with these possibilities? Well, one answer is that, that if at all possible, it's better to not just measure program outcomes, but to measure the various components of program logic so that you'll be able to see what broke down along the way and what didn't. Another answer is that you need stakeholder engagement in evaluation design and interpretation. You want to make sure you're measuring what really matters, and you want to make sure that you learn from the folks on the ground what they think your results might mean. Let's look more closely at the issue of negative evaluation findings. This is our second thorny issue. It's rare that stakeholders are going to be happy when your evaluation suggests that their program isn't working the way they expected. Program leads and staff are particularly likely to be upset. It's important, therefore, that you remind them from the beginning that this is a possibility. Nobody likes to feel blindsided. Once you have the negative findings, how you present them is critical. First, be judicious as to when you share findings with different groups. 
presenting negative findings to a diverse group of stakeholders before you share them with program leads is neither advisable nor responsible. Second, as we just discussed, there are a number of ways in which negative findings might be interpreted, and there are limitations on our ability to interpret any findings. Be honest about that. Third, present your findings as a learning opportunity, not a condemnation of the program. The kind of work that social programs set out to do is hard. If they fall short of expectations, that should not be surprising. Fourth, when possible, provide the information that makes learning and improvement possible. Again, if you can identify where a program broke down, that will be a lot more helpful than just noting that it did break down. Fifth, contextualize your findings. For example, I was once part of a team that found only an 8% difference in outcomes for program recipients and non-recipients. The funder, who'd expected a much larger impact, was extremely upset. When I later searched the literature for effect sizes of similar interventions, I refound our results to be typical. This would have been good to know and discuss when we initially presented the findings. The third and final thorny issue we will deal with today is anxiety about evaluation. Perhaps it should not be surprising that evaluation makes some people anxious. Nobody likes being judged and some people see evaluation as precisely that. The level of anxiety and distrust surrounding a given evaluation needs to be assessed and dealt with. There's a term, excessive evaluation anxiety, to describe a situation in which a stakeholder's anxiety about evaluation has led him or her to become uncooperative or even actively hostile. Evaluation anxiety can stem from stakeholder personality characteristics or negative experiences that a stakeholder has had with evaluation, the context in which the evaluation is being conducted, for example, if defunding is a real possibility, or actions of the evaluator that suggest secretiveness, ill intent, bias, or incompetence. It's essential, therefore, for evaluators to do what they can to build strong relationships of trust with stakeholders and to exhibit competence, a willingness to listen, and transparency. One particular form of excessive evaluation anxiety is program personnel confusing program evaluation with personnel assessment. I often make a point of letting personnel know that I'm not there to judge them as individuals, but to assess the progress of the program as a whole. In circumstances in which evaluator actions cannot reduce excessive evaluation anxiety, the evaluator might want to consider whether the evaluation can be successful or useful, or whether this is a job better passed over. If you've already watched the module on evaluation standards and principles, you may have noticed how well they correspond to some of the solutions to thorny problems described above. This is a good time to point out that the websites where you can find these standards and guiding principles are listed among the resources you can access.